Um, Thank you. So uh, I'm Dr. Uh, Timothy Neal, and I teach uh, politics and history at Asmuth College in upstate New York, right in Rochester on the Finger Lakes. Um, and, you know, my teaching uh, influences my research. I teach on presidents and natural disasters, and my research obviously influences my teaching. So um, because I'm a, I'm a historian, but also have to think like a political scientist sometimes, um, this book is a marriage, if you will, uh, or at least a sort of Venn diagram of the field where I've tried to um, look at different levels of analysis from these different disciplines. Uh, and maybe pulling it all together is also the fact that I'm a public historian. That is, uh, my, my work in the community tends to be about engagement and working with community members. So um, I'm a bit of an oddball, but that's why I'm at a small little Charles college so that I can do pretty much whatever I want. Um, so having said that and giving you a little bit of background, I'm going to jump right in with the slides and we will uh, begin um, talking about playing politics with natural disasters. So I will share my screen and you should be able to see this pretty well. Uh, and obviously we'll, we'll take questions at the end, um, but uh, for those of you who um, are in the field, so this is for, this is like inside baseball. So those of you who are working in this field, look, I argue that the Disaster Relief Act of 1974 was a significant or at least important departure, which is one of the questions in the literature, whether or not it was. But my argument is yes, because mitigation and if you will, preparation become critical in federal policy after that time. I argue that the national flood insurance program continues to encourage risk rather than mitigate it or leave it, but in fact it is served uh, to continue to lead to people uh, developing on floodplains, um, and that comes through in the book. Um, I argue that essentially local and national policy on floodplain development really needs our attention, um, and that's, you know, with the impact of climate change, which we're seeing already, um, the differential uh, water patterns that we're seeing the hydrological um, tables are changing. And of course, the more you develop, the water's gotta go somewhere and it tends to go into places it didn't before. So um, I think that's one of the takeaways from the book. Um, I find that local regions um, do not reap long-term benefits from federal relief packages. And then again, that's a question that's come up in the literature of whether or not disaster capitalism can be beneficial to local areas for development. But the long-term study of Hurricane Agnes and the communities it, it affected shows clearly not. Uh, but I do um, support in the book this concept of disaster capitalism, sometimes associated with uh, uh, you know, people like Naomi Klein and others, um, but also disaster gerrymandering, which is the idea that, that um, often if you look for how um, benefits are delivered to constituents, that the electoral politics has um, a, a role in that. And then um, I'm working towards a new idea coming out of my public history background, where I'm looking at the construction of disaster memories. And I find that, um, that they tend to reinforce the ideal of the community that all came together and we, we shared this burden and somehow we're a resilient community but they de-emphasize all of the problems that caused disasters in the first place. And the disaster memory is one of the obstacles, I think, to real reform when it comes to things like local development policies to get people off the floodplains, to stop construction, to buy and um, tear down structures that are already in dangerous locations. So those are some of the things uh, that you'll find in this book. Again, this is kind of the inside Baseball. This is for the, the, the technical experts who um, already are imbued in this. Uh, certainly, if you're not, you can still enjoy the book. And today, this is pitched at, a, uh, at not necessarily an expert level, but uh, certainly um, it reveals what's in the book by going through just, just a talk about the hurricane, some of the key people, the actual locations where this occurred, uh, uh, talk about public policy, and then some points to consider. And again, I hope it will provoke some thoughts. I hope some of you had a chance 
to maybe read the book. Um, it's uh, certainly not necessary. I'll tell you what's what's in the book, um, and maybe you'll go out and get a copy. Um, it is slim. I intentionally kept it uh, like around 200 some pages uh, because I know that my students don't read more than that. So uh, I haven't assigned it or anything in my own classes. Um, so, but but I think they would read it. All right. So Hurricane Agnes. Uh, terrific satellite photograph right there that tells you something about 1972 we had satellites in space that were able to track uh, hurricanes we didn't have many. Uh, we had very few in 1972 uh, and I talk about the National Weather Service in the book and George Cressman and some of the others that played a key role in trying to create more scientific approaches to uh, the weather service uh, and so. Um, Hurricane Agnes is going to strike uh, Florida on the 19th of June, 1972, and it's going to move then up the eastern seaboard, really becoming a tropical storm. So Hurricane Agnes is a bit of a misnomer uh, if you want to get technical, but in fact, that's what everybody in the local regions call it. So uh, geographically, you know, if they call it Hausman Street, not, you know, Houston Street or something, you, you go by what the locals say. So they call it Hurricane Agnes, so I did too in the, in the book. Ultimately, uh, it was only, um, if you will, only uh, a, a, a level one hurricane. So um, it wasn't the strongest storm ever, uh, but it did, you know, uh, it killed 128 people. Tens of thousands of people were made homeless along the Eastern Seaboard. Uh, $3.1 billion in damage. Again, as Charles mentioned, at that time, the most expensive storm um, and caused really historic flooding in, in the mid-Atlantic region. So Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, New York. Uh, and um, uh, I'm going to concentrate in the book and, and this talk on Pennsylvania and New York, which took the brunt of uh, the flooding uh, over, you know, 54 people were killed in Pennsylvania alone. So um, much of the death toll in Corning, New York, which I talk about, 19 people died. So for those local regions, this was a fairly uh, devastating uh, hurricane. Um, and so we do, you know, we do look at uh, a variety of these areas, but especially hard hit um, are going to be places in, in Virginia. Maryland, New York, and Pennsylvania. So then you, you can follow the track of the storm, where it made landfall, and then how it, it um, stalled over the mid-Atlantic, just around um, Pennsylvania and New York, where a, a secondary storm uh, out of the Ohio Valley uh, joined with it, and, they, and it was torrential rains. It had already been a very wet spring, uh, so essentially the water had no place to go. Uh, it had filled up all the uh, aquifers and it was uh, then building up on the rivers, uh, particularly the river system that's going to uh, be called the Susquehanna, which is the longest river system in the Northeast. There's two branches uh, and the outlet is in Hobbit Grace in Maryland. But as you can see from the map, um, it's, it's going to be devastating flooding along these areas where um, the Susquehanna River Basin is. And that was uh, really also another thing that attracted me uh, to the story was just how widespread this disaster was. It wasn't just a local disaster, it was a national disaster on the Eastern Seaboard. Um, but even if you just um, isolate New York and Pennsylvania, the tremendous flooding that occurred throughout those regions uh, in 1972 was um, historic. Um, part of the problem uh, is this. Um, after the Second World War, as uh, people began to move into the floodplain, uh, the response by the federal government had been to provide um, limited relief, um, but also then to build flood control projects. The Army Corps of Engineers, which, um, as you know, uh, was sort of a dikes and levees only until the great flood of 1927 had begun building dams and other structural barriers. Uh, the 1936 Flood Control Act and 1945 Control Act and some of these other things I do relate in the book, but, but essentially there was this nasty cycle. So you get flooded, 
so you get more flood control so you can build, build more in areas that are prone to flooding. And so you're constantly in a battle with nature over how high your dikes or levees should be or how big your containment dams should be to hold the water back when springtime flooding, natural flooding occurs. And flooding has occurred in this area. Europeans have noted it since they came into this area. And uh, native sources also indicate that along the Susquehanna, there was a tremendous amount of flooding. So flooding was not new. It wasn't um, you know, some dramatic change in climate. It was a naturally occurring event. But in the mid 20th century, the idea was that we had the technology and science to overcome nature. And um, as we know from uh, our recent events with the pandemic, that uh, science and technology only get you so far when you confront uh, the natural hazards. So the structural barriers gave a kind of delusion of safety to people living in Wilkes-Barre, in, um, in Corning and Elmira. They had these dikes and levees that had been built after 1936. They assumed that they would hold even the, the night before the flooding, which occurred June 23rd, Corning, Elmira, Wilkes-Barre they assumed they were okay. And that of course was the folly of technology and science, but also um, it speaks to the fact that, that there was a lack of communication between these isolated communities. Um, it's 1972, so you don't have a robust um, a network of communication. Um, you can imagine it's 1972, there's no cell phones. People are relying on the old fashioned telephones that need telephone lines. And in a flood, of course, the river can overwhelm those, knock down power lines, knock down telephone lines. So communication becomes quite um, uh, difficult to maintain without some sort of electrical source or CB radio or something. Um, dams across the area were reaching peak. And so even in cases where there wasn't um, flooding uh, already to relieve the dam, to let the water go, they of course caused flooding in places, uh, for example, on the Genesee River, um, uh, just south of Rochester, New York. So my argument going back is, is that, you know, we have to look at the places where disasters occur. They occur in our region, right? We, we have to understand the resources they have, the political context, the electoral significance, to really understand how political actors respond. And so that's why I, I, I looked at these three communities. And, and in Wilkes-Barre, which is um, in you know, Pennsylvania, down near Scranton, Northeast PA, old coal country, uh, the, the people there uh, were really following the direction of their civil defense director, a man named Frank Townley. And Frank was convinced that the dams, the levees, the dikes would hold. So he called on the community to come out and sandbag. And, you know, so people came with burlap sacks and, and whatever. Some people brought pillowcases and the community uh, attempted um, to stop the flooding by building up the dikes around Wilkes-Barre. It failed um, around 11 a.m. Uh, by Saturday, the, the it, it had um, failed and people were running for their lives. Um, in Corning, New York, again, people went to bed that night, assuming they were safe. Around 4.30 a.m., the dikes were breached. They were either undercut or um, overtopped. And then, of course, that led to an erosion of the ground it was holding the dike in and then it collapsed further. Um, 19 people would die in Corning. Um, the, uh, the alarms started to sound, but then they were shorted out by power. Uh, the local radio stations went silent. Um, people in Elmira had called Corning to find out what was happening up there because Corning's just a little ways up the river from Elmira, but the phones went dead. Um, and uh, so there was a great deal of confusion People had to scramble to safety on their own. They didn't know exactly where to go. They just went to high ground. Um, but uh, very quickly, the community was isolated. 
um, uh, bridges collapsed, roads buckled, um, the flooding was up to 20 feet high in places, um, up to the second story in most houses. Um, it was uh, actually kind of miraculous that, uh, that the death toll was kept so low in Corning. Elmira was a little different. Elmira uh, is um, a slightly bigger city, uh, about twice as big as Corning. Um, and um, was um, just uh, under the leadership of a, a brand new man named uh, Joe Sartori Jr. Joe uh, was an accountant who had been um, working for the city when they asked him if he would be city manager uh, just, just that June. And so it's June of 1972 and he's new and, and it's starting to rain. So he gets out the flood maps from 1936 and then he decides he's gonna evacuate anywhere there was flooding in 1936. He's gonna do this pretty late at night on Thursday. He's gonna get people out of bed and tell them they need to evacuate. And many people thought that he was gonna get fired because they didn't actually anticipate that a flood would occur. And he himself didn't know, but he wanted to be cautious. Because of that, there was no loss of life in Elmira whatsoever. They were able to evacuate along the river where it was high risk so that um, they maintained uh, life. Obviously, uh, extensive property damage though. And again, they, they suffered collapse of their bridges and their roads and their railroads uh, and the other utilities. Uh, Wilkes-Barre, um, again, uh, waited and waited and waited, even though uh, surrounding communities had begun flooding on Friday, uh, they, were, um, they were anticipating um, that, or even Thursday, um, they're anticipating that they would be able to um, stop the flooding, but they didn't. Uh, so there, there was less time to evacuate for those people as well. And then to make matters worse, um, you know, the water again up to like 20 feet high, 30 feet in some places, um, prevented uh, fires, uh, firefighting. And so, you know, gas leaks and things would, would explode. Uh, and there would be buildings that like burn down to the water line uh, because they couldn't get the fire boats uh, from the US Navy there in time to put out the fires. And they didn't have equipment like that in Wilkes-Barre at that time. So uh, again, the, the, it was a pretty devastating uh, blow to these communities, all of which were already experiencing the very beginnings of what today we call the industrialization. And I go into this, um, put a bit in the book and give you some stats and figures, but just to say that manufacturing was declining, certainly in the Northeast. Uh, we began to move South uh, in the United States. And then of course, to the global South uh, and to flee America. And it has a lot to do with both tax policy uh, with where uh, manufacturing was going. Um, and so the economy is changing just at a time when these poor communities are afflicted with this flooding that will destroy um, 25 to 50% of their housing stock and businesses. So um, some of the places uh, that I list here, America, La France, which, is, um, which was the largest manufacturer of fire engines in the US, they closed for good. Uh, Remington Rand, um, some would claim the largest typewriter manufacturer in the US, which was located in Elmira as well, also closed and didn't open. And so there's a number of dislocations caused by this that are going to um, exacerbate or accelerate changes that were already in place due to deindustrialization. But it also means you're not going to see a lot of companies decide to come back or to invest in these Northeastern areas. So you're really gonna have to think after the flood, what your practice would be. Now, it's 1972, they don't have a crystal ball. There's no uh, you know, professor uh, telling them, well, you know, in 20 years. Um, so there, a lot of these places are just gonna decide to try to rebuild exactly as they were. Um, and, and the result of that is, is gonna be that they don't stave off the industrialization, which will eventually erode them and, um, and, uh, and cause, uh, if you will, a, a secondary disaster to their economy. 
I also want to uh, point out the book does focus on people. Um, and, and Charles is right to point out that the book falls between what my editor called the two chairs. It's not quite political science and it's not quite history. And um, we went back and forth on this um, and, uh, and, and you know, delayed publication for, uh, for actually a, a fairly decent amount of time as um, we, we kept trying to find that balance point uh, that the editor thought would reach the right um, people. So, um, you know, I have chapters of material that never got in the book. Um, so, and about, but, but I think people are important in understanding history, not just because of their individuality, this isn't the great person, but also because you can use individuals to represent the various interest groups that are involved. Um, yes, their, their own individual quirks and ambitions, I think are important because they help you understand their effectiveness or their persona in the community. But I really do think that you can use individuals to represent then the interest, say, of um, emergency management, or you can use, um, you know, represent um, representatives from Congress or um, senators or even just emergent leaders. And so the book does do that. Um, and, you know, so we have a Obviously, it's 1972. It's the administration of Richard Nixon. Um, it's a very different kind of Republican Party, but it's already changing and becoming much more like the kind of conservative party uh, that Ronald Reagan would refashion. Uh, Nixon himself claims to be a conservative, despite the many um, socially progressive policies that he um, signed into law, uh, but despised. Uh, fellow Republicans who we thought were too liberal. For example, in this picture, you'll see Rockefeller on the very end. Uh, Nixon um, used Rockefeller to run his New York campaign, but thought Nelson Rockefeller was a little too uh, liberal for his own taste. Uh, he did not like George Romney that much. George Romney was a rival in 1968 for the White House. And um, after Romney uh, bailed um, in New Hampshire, where he was, you know, beat by undecided voters. <laughs> I mean, he undecided got more votes than George Romney. Um, he ended up going into Nixon's cabinet and running the housing and urban development, which was brand new uh, Johnson and Johnson uh, cabinet position. Um, Nixon wanted to eliminate it. George Romney found that it was something he wanted to um, really utilize um, to do a more moderate, if you will, Republican um, sort of socially uh, progressive, but fiscally responsive um, change. So people make, make up this story. Obviously, the, the, sort of the center is Richard Nixon, who uh, in June of 1972 was embroiled in something called the Watergate controversy already. In fact, the day that the flood hit, he was, um, as we know from transcripts and tapes, he was... Uh, planning ways to shut down the investigation that had uh, begun um, into the break-in at the Democratic National Headquarters at the Watergate Hotel uh, by members of the committee to reelect the president. So um, his mind would be really focused on um, the election of 1972 and Agnes would fall into this as part of the scheme. He really didn't show that much compassion, if you will, he did, um, he, he flew overhead, he went to Camp David that weekend. He wanted to plan his all-star team for Major League Baseball's all-star break. Um, that was where his mind was. Uh, but he was finally persuaded by his um, aides to at least uh, helicopter into Harrisburg, PA uh, to make a, a short stop uh, on Saturday to meet people who were made homeless by the flood. Um, and to do a little bit of um, PR work. But uh, instead, Nixon decided to send his vice president down to check the flooded areas. Now, we now expect and anticipate that the president of the United States will somehow show up at a disaster site uh, at a time that's convenient, maybe not immediately, um, but to, in an almost anthological way, bring national healing and show support to the victims. That was started by Lyndon Johnson. And 
Nixon uh, was not initially willing to follow that playbook. So he just dispatched um, Agnew. Agnew went out and, and even though people told him how bad things were and what kind of federal aid they needed, he decided not to tell Nixon the straight story um, and instead sugarcoated everything and told him how great the um, emergency management was going in these areas. So Nixon would be slightly in the dark, but that's, I think, where Nixon liked to be uh, most of the time. You have your congressional representatives um, and, and they can, again, represent different kinds of uh, 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 congressional uh, constituent services. For example, the, the gentleman named Howard Robinson, Robinson was um, much more constituent services. He did a lot of behind the scenes kind of work. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, work between him and uh, the representative of the Office of Emergency Preparedness, who was uh, who came down um, to assist. And um, James Hastings was much more of a, a PR person. He wanted to be in the news a lot. And so he was putting out um, press releases like every day. Uh, and of course, is a great example of what we call in the in the field credit claim. He he liked to, if anything good happened, he wanted to jump in front of the camera and claim credit for it. So he's he shows up in the book as well. Um, Hastings would end up going to jail uh, for kickbacks and bribes and corruption. Which, uh, if you're following any of the news about New York State, um, you understand about corruption uh, in New York State politics. Um, Robinson would actually retire. Um, after 1972, um, he, he would run in, in 72, but then he retired in 74, uh, fed up with uh, Vietnam. Uh, he was, uh, by then, had a begun to break with Nixon and uh, the Republican Party on that, and also just um, fed up with um, the way things were going and um, in American politics. Uh, he ended his career um, being a lobbyist. Dan Flood appears in the book. Uh, Dan Flood has been the subject of several biographies by now. He served in Congress from the 40s until he too uh, had to end his career due to corruption of kickbacks. In fact, charged with taking bribes at the scene of the disaster in Avoca, which is the airport uh, around uh, just uh, outside of Wilkes-Barre. Uh, but um, he was known for his snidely whiplash mustache, his Shakespearean acting background and his passion for wearing capes and white suits. Uh, he was a, a very important subcommittee chair uh, in an age in which seniority mattered. They were so powerful on the House Appropriations Committee that he was called a cardinal of that committee uh, and was so powerful that even as they converted a lot of space to uh, offices around the Capitol building, he was surrounded by offices, but he had an apartment there that he was allowed to keep. But he would uh, run afoul of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, and uh, he would um, end his career um, in the late 70s. Um, then um, you have your, your senators. Now, senators are interesting. Most of them were really concerned about running for president. <laughs> it, uh, uh, you know, um, James Buckley was uh, a conservative, uh, brother of William F. Buckley, um, was the only conservative um, uh, selected uh, in, in New York uh, history, he would not win re-election. Jacob Javits, uh, very um, much more of a liberal um, Republican in some ways, also broke with Richard Nixon over things like Vietnam uh, and was not well favored. Neither one of these characters, by the way, played any significant role in the post-Agnes um, uh, activities, not in in really um, trying to get more money, not really involved in testifying, not really showing up much. Uh, for the people of New York. And I put them in the book because I wanted to show the contrast between what happened in New York and what happened in Pennsylvania, where their senators were, uh, and their representatives, including um, Dan Flood, were much more active um, in um, pulling uh, to, for more money and even calling, and this is interesting, for uh, essentially indemnifying everyone from the flood. So if you were flooded out, they didn't want you to have to pay a dime. They were arguing the federal government should pay your mortgage off for you and the federal government should um, rebuild your businesses at no cost to you. 
that did not happen, but that's an idea that's been kicking around and still comes um, uh, back in disaster politics. But but definitely, you know, Richard Schweiker uh, was uh, fashioned himself a kind of John F. Kennedy figure and thought he'd be president. He ended up working for Ronald Reagan. Uh, he was briefly on the ticket with uh, with Reagan back in the in the mid seventies when Reagan first ran in seventy six. Um, you Scott. Uh, would um, again, like Howard Robinson, because of Watergate, Hugh Scott would end his career in the next election cycle. And Joe McDade, um, Joe McDade was uh, was from Scranton, uh, but obviously worked hard to help those people flooded uh, north of Wilkes-Barre in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, sadly, he ended his career because uh, he exposed himself in public. So. Um, corruption, politics, all of these things um, play uh, play a key role. And then you've got the contrasting gubernatorial approaches. And we see, we see this today in the pandemic, right? You've got your, uh, your Republican sort of model and your Democratic model in how you dealt with mandates and masking and lockdowns. Well, the same could be said for 1972. Nelson Rockefeller took a fairly hands-off approach. Uh, he showed up the day after the disaster, flew down in an air-conditioned helicopter, shaved, shined shoes, um, met with people, made no promises, got back in a helicopter, and they didn't see him again until October. Milton Schaaf, uh, who was governor of, of Pennsylvania, had to fight the Democrats to get the nomination to become the Democratic governor of Pennsylvania, the first uh, Jewish governor of Pennsylvania, and was... Um, uh, saw flooding firsthand. The, the governor's mansion was flooded uh, by Hurricane Agnes in Harrisburg. And um, he felt uh, compassion for the victims and even um, got the state to change their constitution so he could give direct payments to the victims in Pennsylvania. It wasn't a lot of money, but it was some money. Uh, and it came from the state of Pennsylvania before the federal dollars uh, came in because it would take a while for the federal money to actually, um, uh, for the disaster relief bill to get through Congress. Um, the flood happened in June 23rd, 1972, and the flood relief package is not passed till August 20th of 1972. Think about that time frame um, in terms of some of the turnaround we've seen uh, in more recent disasters. But Chap would play a very active role. He too wanted to be president. In fact, in 1972, he thought he might get on the ticket for the, for the um, Democratic Party because um, the Pennsylvania delegation had been freed um, and they could go with either McGovern or Humphrey in 72. And he wanted to play Kingmaker in July of 72. And, and he thought, oh, well, then I'm gonna, I'll be the first Jewish vice president in American history. Um, the flood took that off the table. He didn't even go uh, to the Democratic convention in 1972. And, um, uh, his career would um, just sort of burn out uh, in the mid-1970s. He ran for president, as most of these people uh, thought to do, and um, uh, didn't make it. So, And then he was out of politics. He wrote a, a musical that no one's ever produced. Then we've got the local people, um, people like Frank Townen, who very stubbornly thought that he was going to um, save Wilkes-Barre by having people sandbag it. Uh, he never really um, talked to any other communities. Um, even as the flood waters were rising, um, the National Weather Service phoned him personally to cajole, plead, and beg with him to call for uh, evacuations because they were convinced by then, um, even though they had to do their calculations by hand using slide rules, because the National Weather Service's River Forecast Center in Harrisburg, guess what, was on the river, flooded, and they lost power. They were working by lanterns, and yet they finally were able to track him down and, and try to convince him um, that he needed to evacuate. Um, his failure, uh, if you will, led to the rise of Dan Flood coming back, leaving uh, Washington, um, he called up Mel Lair at the Faculty Secretary of Defense, and he said, I need your helicopter. And so he was able to command 
uh, a great deal of respect because he was on the House Appropriations Committee and two thirds of the budget, as he claimed, went, went through his hands. So you listened to him when he spoke. And so Dan Flood was able to um, really uh, get people to um, pay attention. And so he went down in, in a, went to the airport in Avoca and uh, pretty much just commanded, told people what to do, uh, told government officials what to do, called on the U.S. Coast Guard to get some of those fire boats in so they could put out the fires before they spread even further, um, and was a fairly effective individual. But again, this was an individual, not necessarily a policy. This was circumventing policy, if you will, because he had the juice to do so. Um, after Watergate, when the Watergate um, babies, as they're sometimes called, were elected. The Democrats stripped away seniority, and you rarely see this kind of power ever again in Washington politics. So that strategy wouldn't work today. But again, um, so Schaap and, and Flood were everywhere in the Wyoming Valley, and they were there constantly, and they were a presence. And, and you know, partly because Dan Flood was the constituent services guy, partly because if you go to Wilkes-Barre, the Daniel Flood uh, School and the Daniel Flood uh, Community Center, the Daniel Flood, he named a lot of things for himself. This guy was so powerful that when the coal, anthrax coal industry began to decline, he got a bill through Congress that required our army bases in Germany to use Pennsylvania coal to heat the barracks. And so that was uh, quite striking. Um, so, um, and and the result was, uh, you know, obviously that they did this because he forced them to. Then there's some individuals I speak about this this idea of uh, emergent leaders. Wilkes-Barre lacked the kind of political structure that you needed to deal with. Um, this catastrophe. And so the, the elites, uh, bankers, businessmen asked uh, Judge Max Rosen, who was on the federal bench to, if you will, take over and uh, lead a special task force. And in Wilkes-Barre, that was pretty normal that you would do that, uh, that they, they'd done this after flooding in 1913 and some hurricanes, I'm sorry, hurricanes, um, tornadoes uh, back in the day. Um, but because it was elite and not listening to the individuals, a former uh, Lady Garment Workers Union uh, unionist by the name of Min Matheson uh, created the Flood Victims Action Council and was really would be a very different group, uh, much more active, much more in your face, whereas Rosen tried to work behind the scenes and get politicians and leaders to take his calls. Min Matheson was out demonstrating and protesting in front of the press and trying to get their plate on the national news. In Elmira, I've already mentioned Joe Sartori. Again, this is a this is a guy who you know was still wet behind the ears. He'd been Chamberlain, uh, which is a fancy way of saying like comptroller in um, in uh, Elmira, and as a result, um, the uh, result was uh, that he stood out and was able to make some significant changes. In Corning, there was something more interesting. Um, although the mayor of Corning, Joe Nasser, was the second longest serving mayor in New York history after Erasmus Corning, no relation to Corning, New York, um, the Houghton family were, had been in uh, Republican politics for years. Uh, you know, they'd been in the House, They'd been ambassadors uh, in the First World War. Um, Emil Houghton Sr. was called the ambassador because he'd been ambassador to France in the 1950s under Eisenhower. And um, the Houghton family was being led at the time of the flood by um, uh, Emil Houghton Jr., who is pictured here facing the camera, the guy with his arms crossed looking at us. His father is to the left and his brother, Jamie, is to the right. Now, Jamie uh, would, would, uh, was interesting. Jamie always donated to Democrats and Amo always donated to Republicans uh, so that the company was well represented uh, by both political parties. But 
Um, the Houghton family would be critical in um, dealing with the flood. First of all, they they decided that they were not, even though their, their company had been flooded and they could have relocated outside of Corning, and there were a lot of reasons to do so, economic reasons, they decided to stay in Corning to rebuild. They were the only, the only holder of flood insurance, by the way, in 1972 in all of Corning. Uh, and so they, they did get some uh, flood insurance for the damage. But it was more than that. They actually created a philanthropic trust and they began to pour money into it. And that money, more than anything, would remake Corning as a tourist destination. They, they bought and created something called the Rockwell Museum of Western Art down there. Uh, they um, helped uh, Watkins Glen, which is a famous racetrack. They, they bought that and kept that open for a number of years. Um, they created a museum called the Watson Homestead. Um, and uh, they were very influential on how uh, Corning was gonna be rebuilt under Mayor Nasser. Nasser um, was sort of the face of a lot of these um, decisions that were public, but behind the scenes, uh, the Houghton family uh, really pulled the strings. And then you've got um, a, a character named Cadillac Bill Smith, and Cadillac Bill Smith is critical to the story uh, insofar as he was a, um, uh, a, a man who um, attempted to reform natural disaster policy at the state level, but ultimately failed. He it was a state senator who called together a special commission who discovered that there really was no responsibility for warnings. Civil defense didn't seem to have responsibility. The National Weather Service didn't have responsibility. The state troopers, uh, the sheriff's departments. So who was responsible for warning people that they needed to evacuate? It was local leaders, most of whom worked in isolation of each other. Um, Nelson Rockefeller rejected um, calls for reform uh, and uh, argued that the national government needed to make those. And then finally, as we we're wrapping up here, um, policies, right? Mm -hmm. Disasters are certainly not natural and they're shaped by, by human interaction with the natural environment or the natural hazards. And policies are a key role in this. Um, in 1972, we'd only really had routine federal disaster relief since 1950. Um, so that was still relatively new. And every year it had been getting more and more generous moving from uh, the federal government giving money to states and localities only to under Lyndon Johnson, giving individuals uh, levels of support, including money, legal services, psychological services. And this would continue somewhat in 1972. But, uh, you know, clearly the local leaders uh, relying on a civil defense agency that was a paper tiger. It was, it was um, made up of people like the civil defense leader in uh, Myra was a former boxer who owned a, a bar, which happened to be the watering hole for local politicians. So they honorifically made him the civil defense leader. Um, and of course, horizontal and vertical fragmentation, miscommunication, fairly common. We had an office of emergency preparedness that was anything but prepared very small staff and, and tasked with a number of different things. I mean, George Lincoln was not only in charge of natural disaster policy, but wage and price freezes were put on his plate and, and talks of when there was a meat shortage, whether or not the OEP would be involved in that. It was a multi-purpose agency under Richard Nixon and didn't operate well. Um, it did not operate well in 1969 when Hurricane Camille struck the US and a self-study by the agency revealed many flaws in the safety net. So, the um, so as, um, as I mentioned, the election loomed over so much of what was happening. Um, and there was the Agnes Relief Act, which was very generous. Nixon decided to um, out and govern and govern. Uh, and as a result, um, this was the most generous Disaster Relief Act in U.S. history to that time, um, and you know, actually forgave up to five thousand dollars, low interest loans, unemployment, legal services uh, to localities. Um, 
sadly, it turns out that even as that money was flowing in and people were using the Small Business Administration to borrow money, most of the lenders tended to be banks outside of the area. So all of the, the resources, the interest payments were being extracted from the community. And many people had to remortgage their home uh, for a second time. They hadn't even paid off their original mortgage. Um, and so the Disaster Act, although enriching a few construction companies, banks, maybe developers, um, real estate agents, did not in fact help individuals that much who were left with the bill. And this is why I said that, that in the long run, this did not help. Um, the flooded cities, uh, Wilkes-Barre rebuilds, but declines significantly. They, they've turned to a casino economy uh, and turned to the Mohegan tribe to try to bail them out, but that money continues to leave Wilkes-Barre. Elmira rebuilt their downtown, but they drove the small business out. They fell into decline and in the 1980s and 90s tried a prison economy. Uh, Corning rebuilt as a tourist destination with some money from the feds, but, but much more so from the Houghton family. And if you go to Corning, it's a much livelier and stable economy. Um, you know, 600,000 people a year visit the Glass Center, which is, you know, the world's largest collection of glass. Um, and um, it's a tourist destination. Um, Deindustrialization continued. Wilkes-Barre lost half of its population since the 1970s. Uh, it continues to be uh, an area of economic decline. Um, I'll skip uh, some of this just to say that Richard Nixon's strategy of being generous, a disaster, um, and even um, using the Agnes Act to um, bring in disasters that had occurred prior to 1972. Uh, to get votes, um, paid dividends. He won every state, but uh, Massachusetts and the District of Columbia in his 1972 bid, 60% um, of the vote. Uh, but of course, after the reduction, he cut the generous benefits, eliminated OEP, folded its functions into HUD. Uh, but, and the key here is he planned legislation to require mitigation, mandated, uh, flood insurance for federally backed loans. And there were two key acts. The Flood Disaster Protection Act of 73, which requires if you are getting a mortgage in a flood zone, you have to have flood insurance, federally backed mortgage. And then number two, um, the um, idea that you would re require people to um, do planning. So you would give states up to $200,000 you would spend uh, more money on mitigation and prevention. He's gonna end the civilian military mix of civil defense and try to create a defense preparedness agency and um, put the disaster, uh, the Federal Disaster Assistance Administration in HUD. Um, and he increased subsidies to try to encourage people to move off of the floodplains and to get flood insurance. Long-term consequences, arguably in the book, I'd say that um, this was sort of the beginnings of, of emergency management by putting more money towards mitigation and prevention and spending money, giving federal money for states to do that planning. You began to create a nascent core group of individuals that would be uh, the first emergency managers. Um, we continued to build new structural barriers throughout this region. We didn't stop that. And of course, we saw devastating flooding in 2011 and then more recently. And so finally, as we go into Q&A, which I know you're all relieved about, our community is safer than they were in 72. <clears throat> our local and state emergency management uh, agencies better equipped than 72. Is our federal disaster response still problematic? How do elections shape disaster response? And now let's go to Q&A. I already saw some questions in there. So I'm gonna stop the share and we'll go to Q&A. Okay, uh, Timothy, that was that was that was incredible. Uh, that was a great lecture, uh, and so many threads to this story, right? Uh, and one of the things that escaped me now, uh, for those of you who know me, uh, know that I'm from Elmira. Okay, and nobody, I always joke, nobody ever makes up lies about the fact that they're from Elmira. Uh, and so I lived through uh, Agnes as a, as, a, as a you know a young young person, a child. <laughs> 
And, you know, some of these characters, you know, I mean, I knew Joe Sartori and, and you know, uh, Bill Smith had a diner uh, that I would go to as a little kid and everybody called him Cadillac Bill Smith. And, you know, he had a farm, his farm always floods, it's out in big flats on a floodplain. And uh, as you point out in the book, his, his uh, tragically lost his daughter uh, mm-hmm. and ended up becoming the origin of uh, what became Mothers Against Drunk Driving it was kind of his last big public uh, act. So enough of the minutia there. But I, I think just uh, while we queue up questions and, and uh, please uh, send them in, I'm going to uh, show a, a, a couple, about two and a half minutes of a video of a song that was inspired by the flooding in Elmira uh, called It Sprinkled, It Rained and It Poured. Uh, just to get you into the uh, into the mood uh, before we uh, start on questions. So, and I think we are ready. Uh, okay. Oh, got the wrong slide. Okay. At 5:28, people were told to evacuate. They could see the river on the rise. Folks fled in panic and fit. And it sprinkled, it rained, and it poured. It sprinkled, it rained, and it poured. The water was too much for the dikes to hold. Get out of your homes, the people were told. The old Chemung River was rising like hell. that and that was uh you know I, I tell you it always when the the beauty was tragically marred they hit that note it still gets me uh all these years later so uh we've got a couple questions queued up here um the first one um is is what influence if any do you think the massive tornado outbreak across the central u.s in april of 74 had on congressional action to pass the disaster relief act of 1974 a week later yeah, I totally, I, I, I actually talk about this in the book. Um, that had been sort of lingering uh, as a reform bill and did not have a lot of um, uh, mojo, if you will, at the time. But after this outbreak, and this was incredible, this was like a, uh, a, a, a across a swath of the U.S., like hundreds of tornadoes broke out due to a weather system. Um, and yes, as a result of that, Congress got together the next week to demonstrate that they were serious about disaster relief, but also disaster reform. And I would say that that was the catalyst, right? So this had been sort of lingering in committees and, and you know, back and forth between the White House. But that event, that was it. That one event, I think, was the spark uh, that got that going. So good, good question. And yes, you're right. Okay. Um, let's see, how do the three cities commemorate the, uh, the flood now? Ah, great question. So uh, again, I was a slight chapter on, on, on history and memory of disasters. 
Um, and, and again, every five years, uh, the local newspapers or TV stations would go ahead and, and run like, you know, film or they would talk to people for uh, 2012 when, you know, you can imagine you're looking at, you know, the 40th anniversary. They had a huge um, series of public events. Uh, in Elmira, they had it in their local library. Um, in Corning, they held a, a, a big exhibit at the Rakow Research Library, which is um, on the campus, if you will, of Corning Incorporated. And then in Wilkes-Barre, they had a big celebration down at the, what they call the, the river uh, walk down there. Um, so each one of them, and, and the, the talk was always about, again, this idea of we came back better than ever, we were resilient, where one people who somehow defy the odds. And it, the problem, again, no one questions why we needed bigger dikes to begin with, why we were so close to the river, um, what role developers play in this. Um, and then again, questioning right after Hurricane Irene and Lee in 2011, why there was such devastating flooding still going on. So um, yeah, the, the public memory, I would argue is fashioned by politicians who want people <laughs> to focus on certain things and forget others. And that's the point about memory, right? You focus on certain things and you're leaving behind others. And um, I've, we've seen, there's, a, there's some studies in other countries about this as well. And, and I would argue that that's exactly the case in most disasters. Um, so be careful when politicians uh, start talking after a disaster. Okay. Um, so let's see, we have a question here about, uh, well, it's more of an observation about the role of, of events in moving legislation forward. And, and that brings me to, I think the point that, it, and uh, for those of you, you know, of course, why would you know? I did my master's thesis on uh, the recovery, the quote unquote recovery of Elmira, New York following uh, Agnes. And, and, and so I was delighted to see this book come out uh, because, um, a lot of these lessons, you know, are, are there, and it's and I didn't even, you know, I didn't, uh, I wasn't even aware. I never connected Watergate to this, with, but in terms of the politics, you know, in many ways, uh, the this kind of uh, you know, the Susquehanna River Valley, and and really that is part of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So the the damage, if you look there, just goes all, all the way down, you know, through Baltimore to Maryland, and, and and all the way up from up in central New York or the southern tier. Uh, but the political power that existed in those areas, if that were to happen today, it's like, who the hell knows who the representative from a Wego, New York is? And why does anybody care? And, and what you know, power would they have in Washington, right? Uh, and so in many ways, I think the, the political uh, response may have been even stronger then than we could muster today if we had a similar event. That's a, that's a great point. And, and I think part of that is um, the blessing and the bane of the bureaucratization of emergency management, right? We've built up a very hefty FEMA. We've built up a, a, a much more uh, coordinated emergency management in our states and even to a certain extent in our localities. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but one of the things I was paying attention to was how well or how awful local governments and officials were doing in New York dealing with the pandemic. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that's important to say how they relied on health um, commissioners uh, uh, in, in their area. But um, so I think today that the Congress has in some way created um, and seeded a lot more of, of sort of the um, influence on disaster policy to the White House and to the bureaucracy, but they're still the ones that come along and have to write the checks. <laughs> so they will still come along and write, you know, $60 billion for this disaster or $1.9 trillion for this disaster we're in now because they need to be shown to be doing something and have to bring home the bacon, they have to go back to their constituents. So that's still critical. Um, but you're right. I mean, can you think of any one member of the House or Senate that was critical in writing the $1.9 trillion rescue package that the president signed, right? It's all about the president. Um, uh, so to a certain extent, unless you're the majority leader uh, or uh, the speaker of the House, 
you, you don't have that that uh, political juice anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and please send your questions in. The uh, the other thing that struck me, and, and I had to, to kind of reaffirm this for our emergency management students, there's this kind of expectation that, uh, or, or expectation the federal government is, is always like a lead agency or, or uh, you know, have a lead role or an important role in, in disaster relief. And if you look at the, you know, the constitutional underpinnings for that position, you know, it's, it's very soft and, and it's fairly recent. And, and, and you see these stark partisan divides. And in fact, we even had this um, uh, comment that came out of, a, I think it was a, a mayor in Texas after their uh, power outages and uh, subsequent freeze and the lack of water, which was, you know, it's not government's job to provide water and heat, you know, uh, go burn your furniture or, you know, go out on the plains and do it as our forebears did it or whatever. Um, but you see that, you know, carrying all the way through, right? And this push between the federal government leadership versus really local government leadership. And you point out, I think, pretty starkly as you, as you read the book, that a lot of the local government capacity was just uh, either non-existent or minimal. Uh, and, and we look forward to today. And, you know, in many ways, we're in the same boat, right? Uh, how, do you, how do you deal with the whole question of, of moral hazard, if you will, on state and local governments because of uh, the federal uh, role that's played in disaster response? Yeah, no, I think, you know, Charles, you're absolutely right in terms of the, both the Constitution, but also even the way all legislation is written, right? Even things like the Stafford Act and, and others that come afterwards. It's always clear to say that, that the federal government can only play a supportive role. The federal government has to be in in to deal with disaster. Now, the 1974 Act did create something called emergency, and, and it did allow the, the president, if in order to save life and, and you know, protect property, whatever, they could take actions before a disaster happened. That was new, and, and, and presidents can do that now, but um, there is a real constitutional uh, mess if the president does that really without being invited in. Um, and uh, even FEMA will tell you, as an individual, you need to have a three-day supply of food, water, whatever, flashlights and batteries, because they don't expect that they're going to be able to help you if, for like 72 hours after a disaster. So we still have the messaging that individuals, local communities, states are responsible for health and safety, i.e. disasters. But the problem is the public perception is... No, the federal government is going to swoop in and save me, um, which is just not going to happen. They will come in as quickly as their um, policies allow them, but also who's ever in charge. And it, and it does make a difference, you know, how prepared they are, um, how they follow their scenarios. I mean, under George H.W. Bush, it, it, FEMA became a kind of dumping ground for people they didn't know what to do with, as opposed to when Clinton came in and he put James Lee Witt in, who had some background in, as a first responder, emergency manager. Uh, I think that helps tremendously understand your mission. Um, but yeah, I would, I would definitely say, uh, so when I teach after disasters, I've had my students do the community response team. They, they take this, this mini course at a local community college as part of the course I'm teaching and they get certified. If there's a disaster, they can they can help, right? This is the way that FEMA is trying to uh, prepare us all to, to protect ourselves. And so they learn basic first aid and, and search and rescue uh, operations. And um, it's taught by first responders. Um, but yeah, it's, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and speaking of, uh, I think probably the biggest uh, federal foray here that the you know uh, I guess to some degree I don't we call it mitigation or. or uh, but we'll leave that aside, the, the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, which is yes, another uh, great uh, federal intervention that we can credit to, to Richard Nixon. Um, but, you know, uh, what, a, what, what a, a rocky history it's had. Um, and, uh, and the question is, is about, uh, you know, the, the, the federal policy of, of trying to buy out uh, places with repetitive losses. And so the, the question talks about... Uh, Davenport, Iowa, where they did a buyout, and I guess I don't know if it's up the river or across the, the Mississippi, Moline, Illinois, 
but they did nothing and continued to uh, uh, get flooded. Yeah. Yes. And, and of course, in the Fed, the, the, they did a reform act uh, where the premiums went up precipitously. And then Congress came in after Sandy and said, oh, no, uh, we're going to undo those because those aren't, you know, feasible. So we're kind of back to where we were again. Yeah, a absolutely. So in 2012, they passed the Bigger Waters Bill, uh, you know, after, you know, um, Hurricane Katrina and some others. I mean, the National Flood Insurance was billions and billions of dollars in debt. And as you know, the premiums are not popular but they're still not high enough to persuade people not to build and to encounter risk. And you mentioned something called the repetitive loss. I mean, there have been some properties that have been rebuilt by the federal government time and time again, to the extent that the value of the rebuild is, you know, 30 times what the initial property cost in, in the beginning. Um, and, but in 2014, after outcries and the press carrying stories of, Poor individuals whose uh, you know insurance went from hundred dollars a year to you know ten thousand dollars a year. Um, they backed off and they passed the Consumer uh, Flood Protection Act, which lowered the rates back down. And my argument is that that only encourages greater risk. That that unless you FEMA has a buyout mitigation program, but it but it only pays up to seventy five percent. So the local entity has to come up with like twenty five percent to pay for it. And once you buy a property out and remove it from a, a flood area, then you can't rebuild on that again. You could build like a picnic structure, right? Or something like that, but you, you can't rebuild a permanent structure. So think about that for local governments. That's uh, That takes a, a property in a, probably a very nice area out of the tax. So property taxes are, are now being removed and because it's now no longer, it's sort of a public space, guess who's got to mow the lawn or, or take care of it? The local government. So it's, it's this um, tension between the two ideas. Um, I live uh, a mile and a half from Lake Ontario. I, I, I run up there all the time and there's some terrific flooding there, not in a good way, bad flooding, I should say, um, in, um, in 2014. And, uh, and and on. And so there was calls for the federal government to lower the table and it raise the amount of water going to St. Lawrence Seaway and do some other things. Um, uh, very few people were, were interested in the idea of knocking down those houses and, and uh, just turning that back into um, open space, even though that is probably what should be done because those flooding, it's flooding's gonna happen. It's, it's erosion's gonna occur. I always tell my students when we talk about climate change, you can't stop change. As a historian, you know, static kind of change is normal, right? You, you, and we, we pick species we want to survive, but we're stopping uh, sort of, we're intervening in a way that I'm not sure we really thought through. Um, and rebuilding in these, these flood zones is, um, again, we're subsidizing it because people know they have the flood insurance that will pay for the, you know, the replacement. Um, but again, it's not enough to keep people from rebuilding or, or mandating. It's more stringent. Like if you go to Galveston or someplace like that where everything's up on stilts or, or the Outer Banks where they still build these million dollar homes, but they're up on stilts at least to mitigate uh, or prevent. So uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm troubled by the National Flood Insurance um, Program. And, and I, you know, in, in, unless Congress has the will to really make it sting, or we up the mitigation amount to 100% or whatever, um, I don't see uh, much action. Okay. Uh, we've got a question here on uh, familiarity with uh, strengthening the Mitigation Act provisions, uh, the sorry, the strengthening provisions of the Stafford Act. Uh, following Hugo and Andrew uh, that, that failed? If so, what relationship do you think these have to what we witnessed in uh, Hurricanes Katrina and Rita? Yeah, I, I, I can't speak specifically to, the, to, to that, um, but I, I, I know in general about that change that it's not something that I wrote about, for example. Um, but um, yes, uh, anytime you, you attempt to, 
here's the thing. For every dollar you spend on mitigation, you save at least $5 in disaster relief, repair, whatever. But the public does not have an appetite for any kind of spending that they can't visibly see. Right? So if we'd been so prepared for this pandemic that we hadn't even noticed it, there, no doubt people would have been complaining that we were spending way too much money on something that was never going to happen. Because if it doesn't happen, the public doesn't have an appetite. And there's been some great research on that and how voters, uh, a great article, myopic voters, right? Because they don't understand that mitigation is something that you need to do. I think the most brilliant thing that the fire department ever did in New York is they, they have a millage and they can vote basically the fire taxes separately from everything else. So we're very good when it comes to fire prevention in New York because people don't participate in those elections. Uh, and even if they did, it's a millage. It's not even like a cent at a time. So it's so incremental, but every year it goes up. Uh, my point being that we need to be maybe more strategic about how we embed some of these things in. So, um, you know, the public, which doesn't quite understand everything well, um, won't be so incensed by what they see as ways to win. There's obviously other issues that need our immediate attention, which I understand, but you don't want to get in a situation where you have a natural disaster um, and threaten your life or limb. So. Uh, yeah, and I think there's a lot of uh, parallels here. If we even look at, and you know, it's been a lot of time, 40, 40 plus years, right? Uh, okay. And yet we still have some of these same problems, right? Some of these same tensions. Uh, you know, the wildfire evacuation issue, wide open out in, you know, California in the last two, three years, you know, and over multiple fires, the same issues of, you know, how do we notify people to evacuate? And why is it we haven't figured these things out? And uh, in that case, I mean, the, some of the preliminary work I've done is, is, is it's very much rooted in, as is, you know, the, the federal disaster policy, it's a local control. Right, so it goes down to the level of uh, maybe a county sheriff, or maybe even beyond that to a town manager, or the, you know yeah. the town police chief, and you've got these little isolated uh, or, or relatively small municipalities, you know this whole patchwork of them, and then you look at it from the top when an event happens, and why didn't things work well? And you look down at the ground, and it's like, well, of course, you know, you've got this this you know hodgepodge of local officials of varying expertise of varying capacity, trying to make life and death decisions under stressful conditions. And we're wondering why we don't, you know, things haven't improved in some ways. Uh, yeah. And so I don't know. Uh, so, so what, what as a, somebody who's, you know, have, having written the book, what lessons would you have there for emergency management students and scholars in terms of, uh, you know, how do you, how do you reconcile those things? Uh, because we're always, you know, I feel like emergency management is central as it is to so many things. We're like any other kind of specialty, you know, and if we were, you know, orthodontists, we sit up all night saying, oh my God, all those crooked teeth, you know, <laughs> if I just, they would mandate braces, uh, we could, you know, have perfect smiles all across the world. Um, you know, what do we do about this fact that really it's, it's a local responsibility and, and, and it's divided so much between levels of government? Well, I will say that, you know, the one place the federal government can always help is with resourcing. And what I mean by that is, again, the argument in the book is that because he gave 200,000, which was a good amount of money back in the, in the 1970s, um, that you at least began to see uh, the origins of people thinking through and planning for these things, which is going to uh, ultimately you know, create that sort of first generation that's going to be available when FEMA comes online in, in 79. And then the states start creating their own, if you will, FEMA style emergency management. But we really don't have much of that at the county level. And, and I think we need to start then, you know, um, thinking about ways that we could empower the counties. And that was actually uh, Cadillac Bill's idea. He said, no, I think the counties need to have the ability to make some of these emergency management decisions. 
And again, Rockefeller's balked at that because the state would have had to pay the price. But if you could get the federal resources to, to come in and, and to pay you know, half of that or some such, um, particularly in areas that have seen disasters, um, maybe you could get a model going for something like that. Um, or you know, even some private foundations that are interested in this to, to get a model to see how that would work um, and, and, and to strengthen um, you know, the, the, again, that, that incredible emergency management uh, center down in uh, Maryland, right? Where, you know, they got the, the Homeland Security, you know, material and they had a fire training center down there at one time. Um, and you start training people. Uh, there is federal money to send people to learn um, things, at, you know, at these, at these spaces. But then when they go home, they don't have the money to set these things in action. Um, and, and, but the problem there too, is, as you may have seen nationally, it's not just, you know, it's states, it's also, um, you know, people dismissing science, right? And saying, you know, health departments shouldn't be making decisions on lockdowns and, and that. And so then you've got a problem because emergency management individuals are generally selected or appointed, not necessarily elected. And that can lead to friction in certain places where, um, uh, the citizenry is much more about individuals and states' rights, but I, I, I would like to see some of this happen at the county level, um, Charles, because I think that would mitigate some of that. And I know some of these counties out in the middle of the country are enormous, uh, you know, but um, you at least would know who the mayors were and you could call them on the phone and you'd have a rapport with them that the federal government doesn't have. Mm -hmm. You know, which was not to discount the, the tremendous progress we have indeed made uh, in emergency management. And if you look at, I was thinking I was probably being too harsh. Um, you know, if, I think if you look at, at, at deaths uh, by a lot of disasters, they're, they're much decreased. Um, and there've been a lot of success stories with mitigation. Um, speaking of New York though, um, and, and it was interesting um, and a lot of good reform ideas seem to die in Albany. Uh, but I don't think New York, New York is unique in that way. Um, but the looking at the whole issue of political, I won't say interference is probably being too judgmental. Well, actually, that's not judgmental, it's a neutral word. Political interference in what are, you know, would otherwise be regarded as technical uh, decisions. And, and we certainly saw it with COVID, right? And, and I will freely admit that uh, decisions about lockdowns and so on are not purely technical decisions, but uh, you know, have uh, do we we continue to see a, a pattern where elected officials kind of come in and take over, uh, maybe cast aside uh, the the wisdom of experience and plans, and they get up there in front of the cameras and you know, I got it, I'm doing it, you know, uh, and we see this kind of cult. Uh, that comes out of, you know, certainly saw here in New York around COVID, right? Um, and Governor Cuomo and his, his uh, Emmy-nominated, uh, you know, fireside chats. Um, and I don't know at the end of the day if that's helpful or hurtful to the prospect of professional emergency management. But I'll go ahead, uh, see if you can uh, step into something with that one, Timothy. I, no, I think, I think you're right in terms of, of the politics of it. And, and again, I, I, we need... Your, your students, people in emergency management, we need to go back over the pandemic and look at, see uh, how these policies were carried out and whether they always made sense. For example, I, I teach at a small college in upstate New York. We are not allowed to have spectators at our college games. High schools can have spectators at their games and professional sports can have spectators at their games. So um, those are the kind of policies made in Albany where for some reason, it's not even the, the I'm pretty sure the experts weren't exactly involved, but for whatever reason, uh, a, a blank decision was made uh, by the politicians uh, and then um, was not re-examined, right? Or if you suggest they re-examine it, then they, um, they get offended uh, and, um, as we know our governor of New York is like to do. Uh, and, and so they don't always re-examine those. And, and so um, I agree that, that politics to a certain extent um, 
you know, there's somewhere in the middle, I'm sure, between um, you know, all of the lockdowns on, on X, Y, and Z uh, and, and, and different ways. For example, we haven't found um, that there's been a lot of spread of, of COVID in schools, right? The mm-hmm. way we've set schools back up in New York, which have been, you know, much of New York State, which have been hybrid or a couple of days a week, they're in school, six feet distance, masks, and then they're home. Um, but that's been a better compromise than just all virtual, right, for, for a lot of places. So um, part of the problem is sometimes we make decisions drawing on past knowledge. We know what we know, or we think we know what we know, and then a novel situation comes up and we try to apply the exact same ideas that worked before, but they're not going to work in the novel situation. Um, so, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll reexamine the pandemic response for sure, and, and no doubt um, but I would hope to think that politicians would also learn that, you know, you got spikes in places where people weren't masked or uh, doing social distancing and you had hospitals overwhelmed and, and we're still going to calculate the number of people who have died or, or have long term COVID symptoms for the rest of their lives. I mean, we have long haulers a year later. Um, I, I heard about somebody who's been in the hospital for a year, I mean, um, because of COVID. So there's a lot we don't know. Okay. Um, we got a question here. I don't know if you have this on the top of your head, that, that uh, figure about uh, mitigation saves $5 in losses down the line. I know that comes from FEMA, uh, where somebody's asking me for a citation on that. Um, I, I to just, um, the myopic voters uh, was the citation. Hang oh, on. Okay. I, I just have to have a copy of my book here. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm going to give last call for questions. We're rolling rolling into three o'clock here, so uh, if you're out there, don't be shy. This is your chance. I'm not going to force you to multitask. You know, I'm going to stay silent rather than starting with a. As much as I love to hear my own voice. Um. Yeah, of course I can't find it right away. Um. Yeah, I can send that to. Uh, is this a student in your class or? Uh, no, it's one of our attendees, but I, I have, uh, I've got his contact information. Yeah, I was going to say, um, I know that the, it starts out mopping voters. Um, uh, that's actually where I get the citation from. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a real number. Uh, it's definitely somewhere on FEMA's website, although they, they, they okay. reorganized, they're reorganizing the FEMA webpage and half the links on it seem to be broken. Yeah, I can pick that up and send that to you, and you can send it to... Uh, uh, to Mark. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Google. <laughs> okay. Good. So, uh, I guess the last question: uh, If you got called today, you know, by the uh, the Biden administration, and they're saying, "How can we uh, fix emergency management in the United States? Uh, what should what reforms? You know, what what one thing uh, that we should be doing? Uh, in in your experience, uh, what would you say?" is the, the, the most important thing that, that federal federal levels should be dealt with. Yeah, I mean, if we, I could pick one thing, um, I would tackle the mitigation and removal of, um, of, of people on floodplains. Floods still are the most persistent uh, disaster, uh, the most ubiquitous uh, disaster. You can find them everywhere. Um, wildfires are quickly becoming maybe number two. But uh, that's what we want to do. But if, the other thing is, I do like the idea of strengthening. So, you know, we support the states. I think we need to uh, create uh, a, a much more um, federal policy aimed at creating a professional core of emergency management individuals uh, at the county level uh, who understand um, and are prepared to deal because that's where disasters are going to break out. And um, so first fix the flood insurance program and remove these structures that are gonna be repetitively flooded. And then number two, um, let's think about how we can strengthen local governments, not state governments, because local governments bear the brunt and they're just not prepared. They're still not prepared. Uh, and then the last, just to clarify that, uh, I think it's a, a, a insightful and excellent point, but the scale problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think the county would be the right landing spot for those capabilities and resources, kind of generally speaking, as opposed to, you know, we've got 
I live in uh, Westchester County and, and we're blessed with, I don't know, 50 municipalities or something crazy like that. Uh, you know, should that, should those resources stick at the county um, or should we divvy them up? And, you know, I'm the village of painted post and I've got, you know, X, you know, three and a half employees and I'm going to get, you know, $1,500 from FEMA. And what are we going to do with that? That's, that's why I wouldn't divvy it up and, and okay. keep it. Uh, my next book, which is coming out uh, this year. Oh, really? Wow. The blizzard of 1977. Uh, and uh, talks about snow control politics uh, because it turns out that winter was not a disaster until 1977, according to the federal government. <laughs> and then suddenly it was. But one of the things I talk about there is I talk about the evolution of sort of uh, dealing with snow control policies at the county level. Because Part of the problem is, you know, even every municipality has its snow plows, but they don't all communicate and they did not cooperate before 77. But after this terrible blizzard that paralyzed Buffalo, New York for days at a time and, um, you know, killed, you know, 18 to 24 people, um, they um, they started banding together and sharing. Um, so I think counties actually um, would be in a good shape because county executives tend to meet. Um, now in New York, you know, uh, we have a number of counties, <laughs> um, uh, and I, so I think that 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 actually, even if even if you've got one county with lots of you know population, um, they still could draw from or support all those counties with smaller, like you know, we've got like North Country in New York where very few people live. Um, you know, ninety percent of people in New York live within, you know, 100 miles of the Erie Canal uh, because that's where the Erie Canal went, that's where the cities went, and that's where the throughway went afterwards. Um, so, you know, I think, I think there would be sufficient status. So, yeah, if you're interested in snow and cold, and the, um, this is the book is The Origins of FEMA. The next book is The Creation of FEMA because I spent time with Jimmy Carter's policy. Uh, I don't think it's a trilogy yet, but, you know, if John Williams calls, um, I'll be ready. Well, that's great. Uh, we look forward to that. And uh, Timothy, it, it was a fantastic talk. Um, it was really insightful uh, and entertaining. And uh, you know, you really did bring a lot of threads together in this book. And, and so uh, I just think it was an entertaining read. Um, and I think there's so much that comes out of it and uh, certainly timely. Uh, with everything going on in emergency management today. So uh, thank you again. Uh, we appreciate it. And uh, thank you for all of our attendees. And uh, I guess that's it. So thanks for coming and thank you, Timothy. Thanks. And I'll send that to you, Charles. So you okay. All right. Thanks a lot. We'll send thanks. it out. Thanks, Greg.